okay, now you just have to say okay. <laughs> and <in> the end. <laughs> right, wonderful, Kim. Um, I'm, I'm really glad we're having this conversation. And um, normally I, I invite people to just actually start with their personal story, start with um, how they connected with the world of people who want to create a more regenerative, thriving future that is inclusive for, for everyone and that addresses some of the structural violence and the, the systemic um, yeah, um, incongruences that we have that just don't, that don't make sense at this point in human history anymore. And so I'm really delighted that we have this conversation and, and um, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Daniel. So um, <laughs> I, I feel like I, I can't really identify a time where I wasn't thinking about these topics. Um, I'm the youngest of four. My parents immigrated from Trinidad and Tobago uh, into the United States. I'm first generation US. Um, actually, my uh, oldest sister is actually born in Canada. But um, yeah, my family voice had um, a lens that uh, we're, we're, we're bigger than you know, our, just our family or just our local community and that we're interconnected globally. Um, growing up, I lived abroad twice. I lived in Okinawa and I also lived in Germany. And uh, so just always appreciating different cultures, different food, different languages, that was just kind of normal. Um, and um, so, so for me, uh, just with how I was raised, a lot of family values around, um, you know, for I'll give you an educational example. Um, you know, earning a degree or going to school or even choosing not to go to school, but just however you acquire knowledge. My parents' philosophy was always about how are you going to apply that knowledge to make society better? That was always, <laughs> that was always the lens. It wasn't about what type of job are you going to get to get income, right? It was about how are you going to apply that knowledge to make things better than how you found it? And even just on a day-to-day -day level, you know, we always say that, you know, if you're, um, you know, staying at someone's house or whatever it is, you always leave things better than you found it. And so I think just growing up, there was always this philosophy that we have to have continuity. You know, the things that we have now and the types of relationships we have now, that doesn't mean they're going to be there forever. We have to put work into those things to make sure they continue. Um, so beyond that, and, and kind of just living abroad, um, and just, as I said before, with my parents being from the Caribbean, uh, my love really just came from being an observer first. <laughs> I think just being the youngest sibling, I think that afforded me a lot of opportunity to be inquisitive, to ask questions. As a child, I was always known for asking why. <laughs> <laughs> way too many times <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know and so I was always intrigued and curious with just why you know why is this happening how does this work and why is this working and so I would read a lot um, I would go to the library a lot and I'm also a little bit very literal of a person so my mom would always say you know go go read something <laughs> which I'm pretty sure in my younger days I think she was just like kicking me out of her office so she could work and I said well what do I read and she's like anything and that's literally what I did as a kid I'd go to the library and you know as tall as I could reach on the shelves you know that would be the book that I would grab and every book I would read it would just spin my brain into something else and I want to read something else so I've always just appreciated just complexity and learning and just trying to absorb and be curious and have an imagination um and so so kind of applying that throughout my life and into adulthood i've had a, a wide variety of uh, occupations i guess you could say um within the u.s military so i'm actually a senior officer in the u.s coast guard i'm going to be retiring uh, in a short few months so i'm really excited about that uh the coast guard has very um uh altruistic kind of humanitarian missions contrasted with say like department of defense or other military services around the world so that really appealed to me just as a person in terms of our environmental response our marine safety response um and and in uh dan you talked about kind of the the incongruencies um that briefly, briefly just yeah. quick, quick question because you said okinawa in germany um were your parents in the service as, as, as well it sound, sounds yes. like military yes yes yeah Yes, they 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 both were in the Air Force and they both enlisted. They both did about 30 years each. And so I actually had mixed feelings about going to the military myself because growing up, um, I saw those are my earliest examples of 
me really questioning the power of institutions. Um, seeing my parents with a West Indian accent, they speak one way at home, they speak a different way at work. I would go into, because they both also worked a part-time job after their military job. So I was lucky if I saw my parents home before midnight, one o'clock in the morning. So because of that, I would have to go, if I wanted to see them a lot, I would have to go after school and go to their job site. So now here I am a kid, I'm on this military base, and I'm seeing these dynamics of how these superior officers are talking to my parents. How I'm just making all these observations of, you know, what what's on the walls? How are people talking? You know, and I would go to, uh, they have what's called it like a commissary, you know, where you get groceries and such. And I would see the, the, these veterans that had just come back from various wars or wars over the past decades, and and I would talk to them you know and and you'd listen and you would begin to hear the obvious disparities of say black veterans how they experienced the vietnam war in conflict so so as a as a child i was like all of these conversations and just observations were just invoking a lot of not just curiosity but in often uh, often cases anger I was angry. I wanted to understand why some institution systems had this type of structural violence and what was the structural violence doing to, to, to cause harm. And then how are we being healed then through, right? Where are the solutions to be healed? You know, and in a military construct, uh, for those who are familiar with the, with the VA department, you know, wow, that, that right? We, we're struggling. We're, we're struggling to get basic care um, for, for everyone across the board. So, uh, so I had mixed feelings about myself uh, uh, joining the military. Actually, my first love was actually art, and I got accepted to an art college. And uh, life took me on a slightly different path. So I ended up pursuing engineering first, and because I was always interested in you know the hows and the whys. And so I kind of took a path of the how versus the why in terms of art and engineering. And uh, so I pursued industrial engineering for undergrad. I went to Florida A and M uh, University at HBCU, and uh, that was really just. It gave me a grounding and appreciation and a deeper understanding of our industrialized complexes around the world and what happens when you insert machines, <laughs> you know, in, in, into our ecosystems um, and, and then going on to earn my uh, master's in business, you know, they gave me a different lens on why are people so, you know, greedy, <laughs> you know, and how does capitalism and different economic systems impact um, uh, our, our futures. Um, and then my PhD I earned from the George Washington University in systems engineering uh, really just kind of encapsulated my life experiences and just my passions. And I wanted to understand systems, um, not just systems of dominance and systems of oppression, but also systems of healing and systems of liberation. And how, so you, did you do all that? Because that's a pretty impressive um, academic training in different fields. Did you do that in parallel of working with the Coast Guards or how, how just so I get, get yeah, you know, yeah, like, that's a yeah. lot. <laughs> yes, I, studying. yeah, it, it is. I, I like to kind of, yeah, be efficient. <laughs> Um, so I, um, I enlisted and joined the Coast Guard when I was 19, so I was halfway through my undergraduate studies. Um, and then, so I finished my bachelor's degree uh, while I was still in the Coast Guard, and then finished my master's degree and PhD while I was still on actor's duty. So I've been able to essentially do two and a half degrees concurrently while serving on active duty. Um, and just to give you a short illustration of how complex that is for my PhD, I actually moved uh, three times <laughs> over three years uh, uh, in that time period. And one of the jobs that I had was actually a special assistant to a cabinet, de de uh, cabinet uh, deputy secretary of Homeland Security. So that job alone was 14 hour days. Uh, and I used to just set my alarm, you know, and, you know, just, just put in the hours, you know, eat dinner, shower, clean, all of that. Uh, get up at two, you know, work work on my PhD work, and then head back to work at seven in the morning. So, um, so for me, you know, when I don't know a system, when you find uh, people activities that energize you, that that keeps me going. So it's never felt like too much. It's always just felt authentic. Because what what I find interesting is that that um, both your life experience of how you grew up questioning you like like getting you to question or, or taking the meta observer role um and and observing how people are 
often unconsciously repeating existing social and cultural design patterns um, that they just absorbed by osmosis are often even unconscious of how hurtful they are and how structurally violent they can be. And they just yes. repeat them because they're not really pulling out enough to watch how they're seeing the world. They're not, they're, 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 it's the, the myth of the objective world out there that we can somehow yes. like billiard balls describe and, and the men and women in white coats, science, scientists know how to do that. Eh? But, right. but complexity science is in and of itself the edge of science that jumps beyond that and says, no, um, Non-linear mathematical systems are fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable since Poincaré, we, we know that, the three-body yes. problem. And therefore, the whole proposition is not control and prediction and manipulation. The whole proposition is appropriate participation. Um, yes. And and that's that's a big shift. And, and it, But at the same time, bringing that again into the command and control structure of being in the Coast Guard, yes. uh, it certainly wouldn't be my cup of tea. I'm, I'm not yes. one who it's likes a, to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's certainly, it's been a journey. And, and I really love the, how you just framed that because yes, I, I've been naturally an observer, um, but in being an observer who is still living <laughs> and participating in these systems, um, you have to you have to actually engage, and so I think for me, when you put in all of these variables and intersections of these systems, and particularly very command and control and structurally violent systems, um, that's how I ended up being a whistleblower. Um, you know, there's there's a certain kind of um, point <laughs> where after you've made so many observations. Um, and then you're observing not just things happening to, to me, um, a black queer woman, um, but it's also things that are happening to my students uh, for a period of time. I was also a college professor within the Coast Guard. So, so you know, I'm dealing with, unfortunately, things like sexual assault, harassment, discrimination. That's already happening within the subset, within the military, then also within the subset of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy where I, where I taught. And so, so for me, it was... Um, imperative, how could I not say something? But at the same time, I saw many people who virtually saw identical observations, but because of the violence of the system, they chose or could not speak up, right? And so uh, so they chose collectively to, to be bystanders. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so vocal. Um, as a whistleblower, I've testified in Capitol Hill. Um, I've, I've helped you know be a catalyst to, to, to pass uh, um, uh, passed um, uh, federal legislation to improve the working environments, not just within the Coast Guard, not just within Homeland Security, where the Coast Guard sits under, but also across uh, across the military at large. And so I'm very uh, proud of that uh, work that I've done. And, um, you know, and I know that uh, we collectively can do better. I know we must be better. So, uh, so no, I actually agree with that, that framing. It's about how do we actually engage? How do we actually participate? Uh, because you can't actually completely remove yourself from any of these systems. We are still, <laughs> we are still impacted every single second of the day by these systems. And in the, the other insight that comes with the, the humbling insight of uncertainty and unpredictability of complex dynamic systems is because of the participatory understanding that we're all just emerging copies uh, of this nested complexity continuously transforming. Mm -hmm. Um, you also realize something really uncomfortable, I think, which is the the um, the responsibility of participation, that it, yes. we all have agency. And as you were just describing, either you use your agency by not activating it, by letting the system run its own agency, because it's also a living system, uh, it, it re auto yes. reproduces itself. And so you, you become... If you're not conscious of your own participation in it, you become part of the systems. Absolutely. And and so, but the minute you really wake up to it, then it's a. As you were speaking, I um, one of my favorite quotes from the the systems engineer and 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 design pioneer Buckminster Fuller came to my mind. He he said, um, "In the end, only integrity is going to count." Yes. 
And what, what he meant with yes, that is you yeah. standing, standing up as a whistleblower to, to actually get to that point. The way you framed it, I really like that. It was sort of, there's just a point where you simply cannot not name it because otherwise you're complicit in the perpetuation of, of, of that system. And um, if we all paid attention to that more often, then I think we would yes. um, break um, structures that no longer serve much more, more quickly. Yes, uh, if I had to distill um, my experiences down to one word, it would be integrity. I actually got chills when you just said that quote. Um, I had the honor and privilege of um, meeting only once uh, the late um, uh, Chairman Elijah Cummings and he and um, Representative Benny Thompson actually did a joint investigation based off of evidence that I shared with them and others had shared with them. They did a two year investigation into, into the Coast Guard examining uh, across you know, our, our entire organization. Um, you know, why are these things occurring? Why are people being harmed? And what do we need to do to, to address it? When I spoke to um, Congressman Cummings in his office privately, uh, it was really just, um, it was just really a surreal experience, but he, he essentially said that, you know, the only thing that we really have in this world is our integrity, you know, and, and that is so powerful because we do have agency and, and, you know, and that's also one of the reasons why I got into education, you know, and we, we, we cannot, we cannot keep saying, you know, well, I didn't know, or I didn't see, I didn't know. We are intelligent enough to know, right? And but we have to have enough integrity to be able to do something about it. And 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 my lens, you know, obviously I've seen a lot of great examples of great humans right across the world doing great things, but I've also seen such high levels of apathy and inaction. And, and as you described, right, we, we just kind of morph right back into the same system as perpetuating these harms. And so uh, so I think just my own experiences, how I was raised, how I grew up, life experiences, um, and then my observation mindset coupled with now I'm an educator, systems engineer, de designer. I think that these are really some uh, really impactful ingredients to help me not only observe, and I would say ethically observe and participate, but then also educate others um, really almost through a healing process because people are coming to me. Mm -hmm. Right in harm, in distress, trying to make sense, trying to make sense, <laughs> you know, of why this harm is happening and why they they feel, felt so helpless. And so, I literally in my in my uh, office at, at the uh, campus, I have this whiteboard, and I would map out every person who come in, and we'd have kind of this coded <laughs> language that I came up with. But I would map out, and I would literally draw to them this is the system right based on what they're sharing with me and i would map out you're feeling pain here 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 what do you think are the driving and i have other people come to my office i draw out another map part of the system and then by the end of the semester a whole picture would illuminate you know and then people would come back in and they would realize oh wait that's someone else's conversation that's someone else's conversation and that would also make them realize they're not alone Right. We're never alone in the experiences that we have. How do we actually work more collectively to make sure that these systems are 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 not uh, doing what they're designed to do? Right. A lot oftentimes is, is perpetuating that violence. So um, so, no, I'm just really, really excited to be able to uh, translate uh, some of those skills uh, in my mind. I call them uh, skill sets, heart sets and mindsets. But but I want to really just continue to to pull those threads forward. Uh, you know, continue to tap into my own ancestry. I come from a family of, of activists and educators and, and just really continue to pull that forward, um, especially as, as I'm looking to retire from the military. And um, so, you know, I came across your work for the love of it and many others across the regenerative community spaces. And uh, so I just really want to continue to dive more deeply into those spaces. Yeah, the, what, what you just made me recall is that um, in my upbringing, because I'm uh, originally German, I grew up in Munich, and um, from about 15 to when I left school, the path I took to cycle to school would take me past the monument that was set up in remembrance of the White Rose, which was the um, Nazi resistance, uh, there were res resistance against the Nazis um, of a, a small group of students. And um, 
it always because it, what what triggered me was when you were said like we we cannot say I didn't know um, because that's something that in in my culture like the, particularly my generation I don't think they get quite so intense history lessons as we got we were like I was still in the mm-hmm. generation in, in the eighties and early nineties where the the kind of there's a one year where they just jam the Third Reich and Hitler yeah. and all, Holocaust so deeply down your throat that you that you feel like not wanting to be German anymore. I mean, that I think it had the effect that I left the country because I never really felt a good um, identity with, with, with my own people until much later in, in life. Um, but um, this question of, wow, these students had the guts to stand up and name that Hitler, where Hitler was going, when the whole country was pretending they didn't see it, um, it was it wasn't, it wasn't it weren't that there, there weren't that many people who really actively went into the resistance and and for a group of young students to do that and um, also have such grace in accepting the the death penalty and really all the way through giving giving an example of kind of Gandhian nonviolent resistance. Yeah? Um, always shaped me always made made me question what what would i do in a in a situation like that uh, yeah. so um but but i i would love you because the the word whistleblower and and in america sometimes um particularly th- driven through the the social media there is this really strong cancel culture this really strong other ring this kind of one yes. one box and another box and there's only two or three yes. characteristics one adjective that somebody attributes to them yes. you already kind of go okay there is one of them yes. or yes. she's one of them and um so what i found really interesting in the initial ex- changes that we had when you reached out was that i i sensed um the right level of compassion to the perpetrators from you in the sense that you don't just go oh, yeah they're just like these people need to be put on the pranger and spat and um mm. th- thrown against them and and, and all that it's mm-hmm. it's more to understand that like i guess because of your systems background you you see it more as a as a field theory like an Anne Mendel's process oriented psychology type way of, yes. of saying, this person is is an expression a voice in the field it's 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 manifesting yes. the structural violence behind this person so i don't need yes. to a- attack the person personally but i do need to be in integrity to name what's behind yes. the pattern and then i i th- really appreciate that because that's for me the big difference that makes a difference um with regard to whistleblowing and and, and healing the system yeah. yes yes absolutely you know and and for for those who are you know perpetuating you know harm you know you can even draw some parallels with um you know say d- domestic violence at, at home you know and there's a lot of bullies who who grow up unfortunately and they were victims of you know harassment or bullying in their own households so so i think that um the compassion really comes from understanding that it's it's the victims and the perpetrators that are both harmed in different ways, obviously, by the same structural violence of the system, right? And I think that um, as what we've seen throughout history is applicable at the individual and organizational level. When you have the harm that is there, that is permeating, and and we have not named it, we haven't addressed it, we haven't healed it, it will continue, it will manifest, it will grow. Um, and, you know, it's hard enough for any one individual, right? If, if there's something really traumatic that happened 40, 50 years ago, you've never sought help. For that's hard for one person to manage. So, you know, over time, right? And, and that's one of the reasons I believe in the United States, at least, why we have so many debates around history and, and, and who, who gets to share the narrative around history, specifically Black history, right? Um, and, and, and why, you know, just the mention of critical race theory automatically goes into some 
<laughs> you know, just out of control conversation. And so I think that uh, there are many of us who find it difficult to actually look in the mirror because I think that's where integrity starts. You have to be able to look into the mirror as an individual and look in the mirror as an organization, right? Is your organizational mission, purpose statement, your operations, your organizational chart, is that really in alignment with you know what you say you're doing versus what you're actually doing? Um, if you say you're, you're you're doing if you're doing something that you say, okay, that's one step. But then what about the impact? Because it's not in isolation. So what about the impact to the environment or the impact to local communities? What footprint? All these types of topics and questions are are important, and, and I think that in a lot of um, you know Western uh, cultures, it's very kind of me, 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 very individualistic. And, and I think that, you know, obviously, you know, we, we need to get more to, to we, because it's always been about we. And I just think that's one of the manifestations of a structurally violent system is to reframe the narrative that is really about I, and that's incredibly dangerous. But it, it's interesting because for me, that particular one, of course, I, I completely agree that we need to deconstruct this hyper individualistic elbow culture of competition and i think the shift from um me to we at the moment that we get in the kind of otto sharma crowd and like the, you get the the whole kind of mm -hmm. from, from from ego to eco framing yes there is a danger of again mental scaffolding of seeing it as a overswinging the pendulum from one extreme paradigm to another extreme paradigm. And I actually think that the big jump into synthesis is very related to what you were saying when you first introduced yourself. Um, I almost uh, highlighted it then. Um, the way you were expressing that, that in your household and your, your parents, it was always the question, well, if you're going to study that, how are you going to yes. serve society with that? And that is actually, for me, the way that we can unleash the potential between the individual and the collective. It's, it's ancient knowledge, the Vedanta calls it seva, um, a, a service mentality of understanding yes. that paradoxically, and, and you, from the little I know about you, but on your studies beautifully demonstrated, um, to fully individuate, to fully bring to the world the unique gift, the essence that only you have, that no other person yes. in the world has apart from you. Yes. You have to do so in service to the nested wholeness you're embedded in. If you just yes. do it to go ahead and be um, a super successful uh, litigation lawyer, um, yes. you, you're actually not able to fully self-realize. Um, yes, and, and I agree. And so, so that, and that's at the core of of the the kind of understanding of regenerative development. That it starts with precisely that: how do we unleash this capacity of individuals collect and collectives to express their uniqueness, but in in a place sourced way. In also not just asking themselves and the co human collective, but also yes. the place itself in which they embed it. So that, absolutely. But, but I wanted to just briefly go back to because you, you beautifully named something there that I think is is also appropriate to highlight in, in two different ways. Um, this that most perpetrators perpetrate because they very often have been traumatized themselves at an earlier point. And what I've realized be, because of this current predisposition or almost anybody to be in a sort of cancel culture mood. Um, I think it got somehow worsened by the pandemic. Um, the, the danger that I keep seeing, like for example, there was this, this kickback against regenerative that came out of uh, the, the, the native um, American or indigenous culture crowd mm. was rightfully naming a sort of inappropriate misrepresentation by Kiss the Ground um, of saying that there's a new way of farming in um, regenerative unison with life's regenerative patterns that that now, are you still there? Because you seem to have frozen. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh um, I'm still here. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the danger there in the framing of, if we open up the indigenous versus non-indigenous, to my mind, what we're not doing is to open the human time horizons of our species long yes. enough. 
we like in terms of the ethical is uh, uh, ethnical issues like the perpetrators of global colonialism in its first second and then third wave through neoliberal colonialism in in, in the 90s and, right. and 2000s um are all people that have been colonialized at some point in their yes lineage history here in europe we just had like different superpowers within europe oppressing lo local place-based indigenous cultures as yes. long as 2500 years ago and yes. but, but the traumas of that the traumas of the witch burnings and the the, the traumas of the the kind of enforced worldview shift in the scientific revolution or the or the inquisition i mean yes so much twisted stuff happened in europe that yeah. to some extent it's no surprise that they went out and built a story where they could do inflict the same stuff on others and and if we go even further back with this with the indigenous north i find we need to anchor regeneration in life itself. I just recently had another beautiful conversation with Fritjof Capra where, where he said, called um, regeneration as the essence of life's self-organization. The way yes. that life is a network of relationships that is nested at different spatial and temporal yes. scales. And that regenerates itself from the cellular to the organ, to the individual level, to the community yes. stories, to the cultural, subculture stories. They all have autopoetic regenerative patterns. And, and, and I think our, our job as facilitators of healthy evolution is to pay attention to both where we need the regeneration of existing structures and we need the renewal of existing structure and to keep, keep um, yes. the system learning. Uh, so th does that resonate with with your perspective? Oh yeah, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. I think that um, you know, I, I shared um, I think just a, a little bit in our email exchanges, but um, I think that there's so much knowledge that we have across the arc of our human history, right? And and through um, you know our indigenous knowledge and epistemologies, you know, we know a lot of information in that regard. Um, and then another piece I wanted to add is in terms of uh, uh, displacement. So we talk about place-based design and place-based regeneration, um, which makes perfect sense. Um, but I also think about, you know, <laughs> history is, is what it was and what it is, right? And so if you have just using the black dice, uh, black or African diaspora as an example, you know, people have been moving forcefully, very violently, uh, and also voluntarily um, in other aspects of history. But people move across the globe, right? And and so I think that there is this um, uh, uh, separation, right? We know in our space where we talk about story of separation, but but I also think that there is value because we have transited around the globe. Right, so we're taking, say, people from West Africa, where where I am ultimately from. Right, uh, through slavery, you have through the Caribbean, then you have other forms of, of of immigration, and so. But there's a thread. There's there are many threads of cultures, right, um, and 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 sounds that don't sound like even words, but they actually are words, you know, amongst a lot of people in the African diaspora, you can trace back to West Africa. And, and so we see just the beauty of even though we are displaced, even though we have endured violence <laughs> systems for hundreds of years, there's still this continuity of language and culture and expression. So I'm also intrigued about um, understanding how we've actually been agile, how we've actually survived and persevered and thrived in the face of that violence, right? And what were those elements that allowed us to still be connected to our own humanity, even as we are displaced? And I think that coupled with groups of people who have had this place uh, uh, history, right, for hundreds of thousands of years in place, that is valuable. And I also think it is incredibly valuable and powerful to, and, and so that, what I guess what I'm trying to say is 
everybody, if you go back far enough, has a history where we are more connected to the earth and we are in more right, right, right relationship with all life. That's true for everybody, but because of the design of these violent structural systems and, and patterns and behaviors, it, it teaches us, <laughs> it teaches us that we have oppressors <laughs> and we have victims of oppressors, oppressors and everyone's just trying to figure it out. But, it, but if we actually go back far enough, we are actually all obviously connected. Um, and, and I think education is one powerful way to, to do that. And I think learning from uh, indigenous uh, groups is another powerful way to learn that. And I just, again, just wanna say, I just think that there's an underappreciation of people who have been displaced for any number of reasons, right? It could be one generation displaced. Even that's the story that you shared about leaving Germany. There, there's, a re there's, there's an explanation behind that, right? And I just think there's value in really this, this cross-pollination of continuity. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's really important because um, this notion of place-sourced regeneration or bioregional regeneration, the necessity to not fall into the, the kind of classical Western um, cognitive scaffolding, which is um, here's an identify a, a problem, then get the sciences in to describe the problem, make it more and more abstract. And then when you have it super described, yes. then you get the designers and engineers in to find solutions to this abstract problem. And then suddenly you're wondering why it's so difficult to scale it out and put it in place because yes. it's connected to place. Yeah? And um, in that sense, I think it is necessary for regenerative practice to have the anchor in the story of place. But place here is fractal. It's a local community and it's bioregion with global connections. And, and what you're speaking to is also this, when we, when we don't make the mistake of presenting regenerative futures, regenerative cultures, regenerative cities, societies, or whatever, everybody's slapping the adjective onto um, whatever yeah. people say. Yeah. Um, but they're all presenting it as ideal future states that one day we might create if you just listen and change your ways. Yeah. And that's where we give away the power of it, because the real power of it is what you were addressing. Um, we're all indigenous to life. And life's fundamental pattern of 3,800 million years is to be regenerative. And we wouldn't be here, neither you nor I, as human beings, as species Homo sapiens, if our ancestors had not been regenerative for most of their journey. It's yes. somewhere around 10,000 years ago with agriculture and city states and power over structures that some of us started to divert from that pattern. And then eventually those and the traumas they caused got more yes. and more of us into that pattern, forcefully yes. or, or not. And so um, I think it's so important to highlight that when we now get more and more groups of people starting bioregional regeneration initiatives, fed up with like another COP on climate, another COP on biodiversity, mm -hmm. and this global problem solving Chiringuitos way, again, the structural violence is so present that you look at the podium and you kind yes. of go, oh, yeah, they have two women, great, wonderful, yeah? and 50 men yeah? um, in the IPCC or in, 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 in right. all of those um, bodies. Um, more and more people are now getting it that if they really want to be agents of change, they need to do it in their place with the diversity of people there. And this is where I think it's really important to highlight that just what you were saying, that the diaspora, the, the, the people who have traveled through, who like I hear on Mallorca, eh, I run into that. I, I get a little bit of, um, well, you'll never be one of us. Um, and, and you can do whatever you want, even if you learn the language and speak it better than, than us. You're not, not us. Eh? And of course, yeah. they're right. I mean, when I lived in Scotland, I never got that. Um, phenotypically, I could be Scottish, and they're, they're just a different people. They don't need, they're, they're strong in themselves and believe in Scotland, but they don't need to define it as other. Yeah? But um, yeah. here on an island, we have 110 nations living on Mallorca. And the regenerative potential of this island is precisely that there are 110 nations living <laughs> on the island. Not that 
some of them call themselves Mallorca and have always been Mallorca. Eh? Um, and, 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 and the danger that, that I'm noticing is that the far right fascist movement in any, anywhere in the world is actually hijacking some of the localization, some of the back to this region, back to our roots and culture. And, and then suddenly, like first it all sounds nice. Yeah, we need to re relearn all ancient arts and crafts and understand what this place was all about, the story of place. And then before you know it, it's suddenly, yeah, and we need to re-migrate all the people that don't belong here. And, um, and then suddenly in yes. a parochial, xenophobic, uh, yes. Reg yes. region regionalism that that is so not about regeneration and we need to call it like in terms of whistleblowing yes. every time we need to call out the distinction yes. between somebody who wants to in kind of gary snyder's terms re-inhabit the place as a regenerative expression of place in our diversity inclu yes. including yes. the diaspora eh? or somebody who is just going no 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 we're, we've been rednecks all along and <laughs> these people don't belong <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's very true. Um, my um, my parents, you know, um, growing up in Trinidad, I think Trinidad is is another island. I think it's very fascinating to me. It's very, um, I think it's per land size. I might be inaccurate, but by land size, I think it's the number one most biodiverse in the world. I think there's some are pretty high up there, but um, yeah, I mean, they're only seven miles north of uh, Venezuela, and you know, my father would tell me stories, you know, growing up speaking um, Hindi and Spanish, and you know, the capital's Port of Spain, and you know, so you have the history of colonialism. Obviously, it's in in Trinidad, but um, but you also have just so much diversity. And mm -hmm. and actually, when my parents uh, came to the United States, it was just after uh, Dr. King was assassinated, and they didn't understand racism, you know, in that in that way. They didn't understand American racism um, because in Trinidad, everyone, <laughs> you know, the 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 people with the less numbers of demographic, you know, were people uh, white from from Europe, you know. So um, everyone was some, you know, shade of shade of shade of brown. And so I think that um, as people have immigrated to Trinidad, you know, over the many, 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 you know, generations, now you have your own, you know, Trinidadian culture, right? It's not, well, I was here first, I was here first, right? We say you're, you know, you're Trini, you know? And so again, you know, to your point, who gets to decide who's home it is, right? Who, who gets to decide that, you know? And, and I think that if we adopt a philosophy of, you know, how are we going to regenerate life? How are we going to live together? How are we going to have joy together? Um, we, we cannot be so separated that we literally begin to other people as we claim we were doing regenerative <laughs> work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I have certainly have seen elements of, uh, you know, of some of that, but I, I definitely agree. And I think that we need to make sure that, um, if we, if we take the position that we value life, we respect life and that we also understand, uh, the structural violence of what created a lot of separation in the first place. If we truly understand the roots of that, then how can we then, in a regenerative mindset, then be exclusionary? You know, the reason why I am an American is because of slavery, <laughs> right? America is not my home, you know, from that context, right? Um, but it is my home now. You know, just as, you know, my heritage is, is being West Indian uh, and my family from Trinidad. So just really just wanted to add, add in some of those layers is that if we, if we understand the roots of separation and if we all care about this story and this, this place of, of home, we have to have more compassion because so many of us have been displaced out of fear, out of violence, out of harm, right? Um, and that's why it, it, it pains me to my core when people say phrases like, you know, well, go, you know, go back to Africa or go back wherever. It's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, our planet is our home, right? Our planet is our home. Yeah, I, my, my parents tell the story that um, when I was seven years old, without really, they don't know where it came from. Um, when we went on holidays and people do the classic, oh, little boy, where do you come from? Uh, I stopped suddenly from one day to the next saying Germany and just called myself like translating an earthling, somebody from Earth. 
um, because it just felt much more appropriate than than I'm German. Uh, but, but but you just used a you, you just used a, a phrase that you also used when when we first um, exchanged a couple of emails. And it, it actually was one of the, the reasons why I really wanted to have this conversation because he was saying, like, how do we make sure that within the regenerative movement, we, we don't end up um, perpetuating structural violent patterns? And, and then he asked so, so exactly that question, like, who decides who goes to the conference? Who decides who gets to teach on these, yes. uh, these webinars or yes. these learning journeys? Um, who amplifies who you also said? Uh, and um, and maybe because I know so many of of the the people who are maybe looked at as um, voices of the regeneration, as this um, <laughs> as this called, um, I also went into that space of compassion and thought like, and I also thought about my own blinkers and my own patterns that how how sometimes when you organize an event like you you just think of oh yeah I need to you think of the people that have influenced your thinking that that that, that have helped yeah. you create a map and so you say well we need that piece of the map and that piece of the map and that piece of the map and you bring it all together and then you suddenly look at it and go oh god white guys again well what? <laughs> and 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 then and then you you can you can go ah oh, no 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 like let's make sure to actively steer against that but it's limited because it's also some of that new conversation, like the regenerative development as expressed by Kara Sanford and, and Regenesis Group, um, even Buckminster Fuller talking regeneration or JT Lyle talking regeneration, they're, they're white people, most of them. I mean, Carol has some yes. Native American background and, and, and there was, to my mind, in all of them, a deep recognition of the importance of indigenous knowledge and place sourced knowledge from the start. But I guess what I'm get, getting to is who gets to decide to do all this? Sometimes I think it's decided by default by a sort of echo chamber network culture that isn't purposefully protecting yeah. it, itself yeah. against, we don't want yeah. any people of whatever other diversity background in yeah. our group. Eh? It's more by, we're, we're getting on doing what we're doing, what we're passionate about. We're, we're finding our peers. We're building a network. And yes, we we're, we're kind of would like that network to become more diverse. And we're like slowly on an individual human to human basis, this kind yeah. of thing happens. Now we know each other. Now I know that if I wanted to put a panel together where I, I, I would want to bring this angle in, I know exactly who to call. Uh, um, yeah. And and so so... I don't know who decides. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's it's the, the the morphing the mycelial network of us waking up to our own regeneration. But I would still love your perspective on how you think the regenerative movement could improve that we don't yeah. do this. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate um, what you just shared, and um, I'm a lifelong uh, educator, which means I'm a lifelong student. And um, so for me, my philosophy is um, we have to be students at all times, which means that space is where we tend to be the educator. Um, and there's agency that, that comes with that. And that's a you know, positionality there. Um, how many other types of spaces are we intentionally going into as students? Um, so we're not the ones who are organizing the events or the conferences. We are going in with the intention to learn. Um, and to maybe frame it a slightly different way, because um, <laughs> I feel like I, I see these patterns and, and may, I, I know I'm not the only one seeing it, but just a few illustrations. So in the United States, we've had a lot of um, tech layoffs recently, and uh, it should be to no surprise to anyone, the majority of those uh, tech layoffs were uh, people of color, uh, Black people specifically. Um, same things happening in the educational uh, system as well. Uh, a lot of people uh, are, you know, not not keeping their jobs, and and you know, the layoffs in the, in the education sector. It's the same patterns, right? And so when you have the, as a system does its thing, <laughs> you know, and, and who's a system designed for it shouldn't be of any surprise who's who's on the chopping block to now be removed from said system. So in my mind, I see tremendous opportunity 
you know, and obviously my heart goes out to people who have been laid off from their careers, they've, you know, invested 10, 20, 50, you know, 20 years and so forth. But I also see opportunity. I see these as, uh, you know, skill sets, mindsets, heart sets, meaning they're transferable. If we care, if any individual cares about making their, their homes, their community, their institutions, the planet better, if that is the starting ground, then there are lots of fields and sectors and people that we can learn from and exchange knowledge from. Um, I think that, um, so again, for me, I try and, you know, maybe I'll just say a few years ago, I wouldn't have necessarily used the language around re regenerative practices in my field. We kind of call it different things. Um, but, but I, over the last 18 months, I've literally signed up for as many regenerative courses as possible um, and, and, and design courses as possible. And that's put me in just great community with folks in Brazil, folks in Hawaii, um, getting to know people like Carol and, and Jenny and you and so many others, which has been great. But it also took being intentional on my part to say, well, I want to learn more about what these folks are describing as regenerative. I have a mindset for my own field, but I specifically want to learn what, what this, you know, what these other groups are doing. And I wanted a diversity of lens as well. Um, and so that's what I chose to do. And that's kind of my life philosophy as well is, you know, you may know something, but that doesn't mean you always have to be the one to speak, <laughs> right? Right. And so, so, so um, I'm really a lifelong student. And it's about how you then ethically learn, ethically, right? Hopefully be invited to these <laughs> places, right? Uh, it's always the hope and the goal. Um, and then how do you apply it collectively together? So that's really, I think, my overarching advice for anyone doing any type of conference or event, because I see the same thing in cybersecurity uh, for my day job uh, all the time. I mean, we can take any sector, right? Cybersecurity is a big one or tech is a big one. We have all these tech conferences. You look at the lineup and it's usually not that diverse um, across the board. And so, so I, I think that just getting slightly maybe out of maybe hypothetically our comfort zones and actually going into those spaces where, yeah, maybe the title didn't say regenerative, you know, maybe it says liberation, maybe it just says education, maybe it says healing, maybe it says anything, I don't know, but just getting more into the habit of going intentionally into other spaces as a student to learn, to identify what are the hard sets, the mindsets and those skill sets that could be transferable. Um, and so um, not to keep blabbing about this, but um, in my career, I've also been a recruiter trying to recruit people into STEM and computer science and, and a lot of uh, federal organizations and other companies, they'll kind of have this kind of typical phrase and they'll say, well, we'd like to have more diversity, but we can't find anybody. <laughs> we, we can't find them. And I'm like, there's lots of talented people out there. You have to know where to look, right? And maybe their college degree doesn't say computer scientist, right? Maybe it actually says psychology, but we need psychologists in cybersecurity too. We need history majors in psychology to, in cybersecurity too. Um, and so when you really open up, now the pool of people is actually larger when we reframe um, what the kind of entering criteria is, if you will. And I think the entering criteria is anyone who cares, <laughs> anyone who cares about life, about our planet, about being in right relationship. Um, I think there's a vast pool of people. And I actually think uh, if I had to speculate, I would conclude a vast majority of people have been recently laid off past year or two, three years, I actually think are prime, prime, prime uh, candidates of folks who have transferable skills to come into uh, more regenerative design spaces. So I actually see this as a beautiful opportunity uh, to actually pave the way for entirely new occupations uh, that can be healing to the individual, healing to our communities and healing to the planet. That's the bridge, the healing. Um, but before I go there, the, the um... Uh, there was so much in there that um, I'm, I'm now where, where, where to take it. Um, the, um, often when I talk to people who are in, in, in corporations or large businesses, and after uh, being polite with them and careful not to offend them as other, um, but making certain systemic patterns visible to them, because they're all intelligent, clever people, um, yes. open-minded, wanting to learn, uh, there sometimes comes that bitter point of realization where they kind of go, 
Ah, okay. My entire industry and my entire business proposition is actually never going to be part of a regenerative world. And that, if you're a manager and if you have responsibility for, I don't know, 10,000 or 15,000 or 200,000 staff around the world, then the next thing is you see the children of that st those staff and you, it's, uh, as a caring human being, you, you feel like, wait a minute, I can't do that. Huh? Yeah. And, and exactly what you were talking about is this, this understanding that it is less about the superstructures that we've built. Um, they need to be flexible enough that they can collapse and dissolve because they only have a certain shelf life where they're relevant yes. to the current context. And then the system transforms and we need to be much better at dissolving corporations and large structures and reforming the structures that then serve at the right scale for the right time. And, and, so, it, it, and so I often say, like, there's a beautiful exercise in the biomimicry world. They call it the genotype phenotype exercise, where, it's, where you basically invite the company to map out not what they're charging for, what they write the invoices for, but what capacity they have in all of their team. Like, what, what are they good at? Yeah. And and then you kind of go, what, how would you redeploy uh, the, the skills within a global mining uh, into the circular economy? Well, there's wonderful ways of, of doing that. Yeah. Um, but that's, so that, that's just one thing in, in terms of really paying attention to the unique gifts of, of people and their capacities and capabilities and, and, and in that celebrating the diversity you can bring of perspectives, of backgrounds, yes. and so on. But the other bit, I also was tempted to say earlier, and, and now when you said healing three times at the end of what you just said, um, earlier when you were speaking about um, your interest in how people who have suffered continuous structural violence over long periods of time, how magically these, these diasporas still hold some golden yeah. thread into their yes. regenerative past. And there's something that is almost indestructible. The, the, the harder the beating gets, the, the more powerful yes. that, that becomes. And um, when I did my PhD research, uh, my, my then PhD supervisor put a book on my table that really changed my life because it gave me the key to reframe what my PhD was all, uh, all about, um, because I thought it was going to be about design for sustainability at the time, um, in, in the early 2000s. It was a book by an Israeli health scientist, a psychologist called Aaron Antonovsky. And Aaron Antonovsky um, did 25 years of research into Holocaust survivors in Israel, and looked at what was the contributor that these human beings who as children or young adults or earlier even as old people could have been in a concentration camp for two, three, four years and then come to Israel and become functional, caring, loving community members um, building yeah. something forward. Like not... Yeah not completely broken, dysfunctional perpetrators themselves. And, right. and um, he said that being deeply rooted in a narrative, um, having a cultural sense of cohesion that um, gives you this, this larger, this is our people, um, can actually make you overcome a, a huge amount of, of, of hardship. But he also, and this is for me, where, how I actually got to regenerative, um, he coined a, a term based on this research that he said our entire medical system is wrong because our medical system looks at health in the way that the regenerative Carol Sanford thinking will be maintain level work. Um, mm -hmm. You you have health as a perfect state of being that um, you fall out of when you show symptoms of disease caused by some form of interruption or stressor or, or, or accident. Mm -hmm. And then the medics come and treat that symptom to put you back into that perfect state. 
So that's a very maintain level kind of falling yeah. out, going back into. But if you look at it in a dynamic way, um, Aaron Antonovsky called it salutogenic approach of health. Health is a lifelong learning journey. Health, health is yes. what happens to us as we get things happening to us, yeah? whether yes. it's accidents or viruses or, or yes. um, and and you don't fall back into the perfect state. As we know, for example, they, 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 the, yes. the, the viruses, human evolution wouldn't be what it is if viruses hadn't altered the course of our evolution in many yes. points of the major yes. jumps in, in the evolutionary journal, uh, journey. And so, so this dynamic salutogenic approach of health, I, in my PhD research then called my PhD Design for Human and Planetary Health and started a whole kind of academic theory framework around this notion of what is salutogenic design, because I also wanted to ask the, the fundamental value question behind assessing anything in terms of a design, yes. a product, a system, a, a, a meta design. And, and I basically, in that work, suggested that we need a Hippocratic oath for this oath for designers and engineers and architects, um, do no harm. Um, and more than that, um, ask yourself, does what I'm doing contribute to the health, wholeness, and dynamic diversity of yes. the larger system? It's it's in the Western world, yes. it was Aldo Leopold and his land ethic that that brought this forth. And a thing is right if it if it um um, nurtures and protects the health diversity and um, something other of the biotic community. It is wrong if it does otherwise. And and so, I I think that this is a bridge because you were saying, not even mentioning regeneration. There is a way of talking about systems healing that is very akin to how complexity science would understand health also as a nested process from cellular health to organ health, individual health, community yes. health, and so on. Um, and if we take that salutogenic lens of how, how do we, because it also is what regeneration to my mind is core, core about, it's stop focusing on the disease or stop focusing on the solution, yes. the, the, the deliverable yes. of your designerly outcome look at the process of learning and how you're learning and everybody else is learning who is touched by the process and who apply the process is actually dynamic and enables the system to learn, become healthier, become more aware, um, whistleblow the, the, the disintegrities yeah. in the system in order for the system to, to become conscious of itself and, and through that be able to learn. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in my um, PhD dissertation, I used uh, a, a viable system uh, methodology. So uh, looking at uh, Beer's work from uh, 1960s and um, uh, the whole premise behind it was really, you know, what makes a system viable? Uh, how does a system withstand any type of disruption? Um, what's happening in the present environment, future environment? How is it being organized? by itself, as it's self-organizing, and then what are those nested systems within it? How's it interacting with other systems? Um, and, and I think for me, I mean, even though, you know, I use the term whistleblower, um, a lot of people um, may have this misconception that, you know, I, I blew the whistle once very loudly and then laws are passed. <laughs> and, was obviously not how it happened, but um, it was really about um, shining a light, you know, as an educator, right? And just as a human being, but just educating one person at a time. And as those individuals began to learn more about the systems that are harming me, that are harming them, that are harming others, now that's shifting their lens, it's shifting their behaviors, it's shifting their values, it's shifting their vocality. And, and, and now that begins to permeate, right? And so now you have other people who are then taking those kind of basic building blocks and they're shining lights on what aspect or part of the system that, that they're in. And so a lot of the um, uh, positive changes that I've made in the Coast Guard, over 30 policies have been changed and a half a dozen laws have been passed. 
that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't a collective of people who were learning more about themselves along the way. And through that learning, translating that into um, behaviors rooted in integrity, where they can, where they get to the point where they say, I can no longer tolerate X. Um, what can I do or what can we do about it? Um, and so I, I, I do think that per- I can only speak from a personal experience. I think that there's a beautiful transformation that happens when we collectively learn together, which is one of the reasons why I think, depending on how people define council culture, is counterproductive. Um, it, it, it really is. Um, I think that we have to be able to understand um, non-linearity, nuances, complexity, um, and, and we have to have some degree of, of more compassion, I'm just going to be honest about that. And, and I, I have just personally seen transformation take place when you have collective journey, collective learning, when people are actually at different points in their journey of learning. Um, and I think something really amazing and beautiful happens when people can come together from their current lens or current positions or current, you know, time, time frame of learning. But we have that compassion with each other as we are learning and co-creating together. I love what you're saying about the, the ethical oath. I think if we were to add another genre of specialty, I would add for DEI practitioners <laughs> within organizations. I think anyone interacting with human beings, there should be a Hippocratic oath. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, I've just seen so many people just do whatever and it causes so much harm, um, even with their stated best of intentions. So, um, so I just really, over the years, I've just really, really loved to see how people can come together in our respective learning journeys, not being judged, right? Um, not being criticized for not knowing, oh, you didn't know that, or you said this phrase, you're not allowed to say this phrase. And I've just always appreciated that when we really strip away, so many of us are carrying the insecurities, the fears, we don't even know how to interact anymore <laughs> with human beings. And I think just creating these spaces where they know that they can show up, not be judged, and they can actually learn and they also know that they have something of value to contribute because I completely agree. Everybody has something of unique and inherent worth that is is needed in this world, and oh, and I think it yes, and it takes it takes people who know how to synthesize, how to intertwine, how to weave, how to catalyze, right? Uh, and uh, we may not have time to jump into this call, but I'm also I'm working on another project. Um, where I'm trying to use um, music design theory as a way to actually convey many of these topics of how do we kind of create the the, the spaces and the movements around not canceling each other. Um, it's called the Symphony Handbook, and it's it's all about saying that we all have agency, we all have a voice, we all have an instrument. We just have to figure out how we play together. How do we orchestrate mm-hmm. that symphony? Um, you know, and each instrument has its own tone, its own timbre, its our own authenticity. We don't need to cancel it. We don't need to tone police it. Some of us are going to be drums, right? That's the rhythm section that remind us of the urgency, right? And some of us are going to maybe be the horn section who know how to improvise. And all the instruments add beauty, add value, you know? <laughs> and, and, and when we play this music together, there is a vibration, right? And, and music by design invokes emotion. It evokes movement by design. So I'm really kind of playing with this concept of music design theory to bring people in across these different disciplines into regenerative practices and regenerative futures. That's so lovely because it's, it's, it's actually a deepening of, I, for me, one of the big learnings in the last two, three years is, that, is to understand that to reactivate the existing regenerative patterns that are all there, not even just to reactivate, actually, to, 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 like, what you were just saying, um, the, the fact that regeneration is actually going on everywhere at this very point, because well, it's going yes. on in every one of our cells and it's, it's going on in every town. There's somebody yes. regenerating a certain aspect of the system. Yes. And um, it might be taking care of an endangered species. It might be educating farmers about soil health. It might be yes. um, a social justice question. Um, 
And what cancel culture can produce, or even the, the, the kind of forever of this is the most important issue, don't you see, is that yes. we burn out because we, we, we think that it's all about this particular thing that we're doing our chipping in the system. And we don't see the, that everybody else is doing their positive healing, salutogenic yes. in their part of the system. And, and so much of, of creating system change is in complex dynamic systems that you can't predict and control is to make the system see itself. Yes. At a higher level of complexity and to create the, the, the unifying narrative that not to everybody do the same thing and join the movement of the great um, yes. leader. Yeah? Yes. Um, it, it's about everybody getting on with what they're doing in a way that they understand that this contributes to the health of the whole. And, and yes. Then we can celebrate diversity in, in, in completely new ways. And um, I love the, the metaphor of, of, or not metaphor, the practic, uh, practical um, that dynamic of understanding this as a symphony and, yes. and the different um, contributions to the overall. There, there, there's a, there, because it is a holistic, com complex system. Um, yes. music, music isn't just the sum of the notes. Yeah, as yes. you say, yes. there's so much emergent property that comes out of a symphony in yes. its supportive powers and all of that. And so th th that's really amazing. I would love to read more about that. So in, when people, if people listen to this and, and want to find out more about your work, where would they go and uh, find out more about it? And also where, how would you like to interact with the regenerative movement as you see it um, in, in the future? Yeah, um, so no, this has just been a really lovely conversation. Um, I'm in the process of kind of putting up a, a website and kind of getting getting my my um, information more publicly, but for the time being, it's best to reach me on LinkedIn. It's just Kimberly Young McClear hyphenated. And hopefully over the next uh, three to six months, I'll have something a little bit more um, up to date in terms of a website that has more on the symphony handbook and some of the other projects I'm working on. And um, where I see myself uh, getting involved <laughs> anywhere and everywhere, I, I just, um, this is life work for me. It, it's just, it just is, it gives me life and it, you know, and I want to be able to uh, continue my, you know, my village. Uh, um, uh, in the military for 20 years. It's, it's been a hard 20 years. I've met a lot of great people from the Coast Guard, but uh, I've endured a lot and I've endured too much, to be honest. So um, I'm really just excited and eager to find, you know, find a village and hopefully more than one village of people who are passionate about life, fas passionate about futures, uh, and passionate about joy and aliveness and creativity. So I am honestly just open to uh, exploring um, any relationship, right, in these spaces. For me, the bar is pretty low. You know, do you care about the planet? <laughs> you know, do you, do you care about integrity? <laughs> you know, the bar is pretty low. So, so if you check yes and yes to those two questions, uh, you know, I want to meet you, I want to get to know you, and, <laughs> and you know, let's, let's make some music together. Let's, let's get some work done together. See, this is, that, that, that's another th thing to maybe highlight um, that, that also came to mind um, when, when you first reached out, because um, there's, a, there's a point in the networking and expanding one's network and, and um, core learning that is expansive. And then there are other phases, as because we're also talking about it, it so much depends on what phase you're in eh? in, your, in your life. I'm noticing that that, that I've for, for 20 years I was just really excited every time I managed to get a even more complex transdisciplinary collaboration going across continents in, with practice element and all that. And right now my world's kind of shrunk a little bit towards wanting to re-inhabit. I have a five and a half year old daughter. I'm, I'm taking care of a food forest. I'm renovating a house to be more sustainable or less um, impactful. And um, and then I get into these situations that that 
I sometimes say no to people who want to build network and reach out. And it, 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 I just wanted to highlight that for those people who, because of that question, who gets to decide who's in, who's out, who's good. It, sometimes it's, it's also the capacity of some of those people in the movement yes. um, to actually hold the diversity. Like I get so many beautiful PDFs and PowerPoints where people say, could you just look at these 20 slides and then hop on a call with me next week? And I kind of go, um, if I did that with everybody, then I wouldn't have a life. Um, but then I also get these highlights where somebody like you comes along and I kind of go, well, yeah, I, I'm just going to make time for this because as I knew, it, this was going to be a really enriching conversation and it has been. So um, it's lovely to meet you and um, let's stay in touch. And I'll yeah. you can I'll, I'll put your LinkedIn in the subscript of the of the thing when it, when I post it and send you send you the link and you can share it with anybody. And yeah, it's, it's I, a yeah. No, just collective commons copyright. I hope it's okay to share the conversation. Are yes, you... of course. Yes, yes, of course. I'm very okay. And you know, I just want to just add one other quick point about the capacity and totally understand and agree with that. I think that um, that's part of the diversity in the space is that for those of us uh, put myself in this bucket that maybe have more capacity um you know there's people who i may know in my network or i know of other nodes of networks that i feel are not yet included in in these spaces and so that is something um that i would be very interested in in doing more of is to help um uh, weave and also connect those other groups to to these groups. Um, so, um, so I would say, from a capacity perspective, I would love to be able to, um, you know, keep building bridges across these these different groups because um, I see so many beautiful things happening. But sometimes we don't all know what the other groups are doing. So that's certainly something I have within my capacity to to, to offer as well. Super. The, 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 the last thing that I now remembered something that I wanted to say earlier. Uh, um, was that with the kind of predispositions and pitfalls of cancel culture. Um, um, it's related to this kind of over uh, simplifying the framing from I to we or ego to eco. Um, um, I often use the image of um, over swinging the pendulum. So going from one extreme to the other extreme. And the interesting thing is, to some extent, you need to do that. Like you need to overbalance if, if we we're all so steeped in mechanistic reductionist thinking and all our metaphors are about machines and the only thing that counts is quantifying mm -hmm. data with a statistical p-value then you need to overswing into saying hey there are other ways of knowing that don't fall into this analytical thinking mindset that are valid and that have access to to real wisdom and knowledge through sensing feeling and intuiting and um but the but the thing is when you go from one to the other and then you realize what you actually needed to get to is the middle ground of the synthesis of the two of them yes. if you're on that pendulum swing on the backward journey and you meet somebody who's on the outward journey and they have a quick conversation what you're saying by valuing the other where they come from again triggers them into canceling you because they actually perceive you as being behind you in that journey. Oh, you haven't understood it yet. Yeah. You don't understand that you might have actually gone through all of that and then come to a point of working with, I mean, it, I can only, we, we didn't go into any of the details of it and it was absolutely ne not necessary, but the, the things that happened to you in the Coast Guards would 100% justify vilifying the perpetrator forever. And being able to do the work to then walk towards that again that's that's the real systems healing where it, it becomes so much more powerful than than a um a, just a sort of on the soapbox yeah. over there yeah. and so so really really appreciate um also the whole journey is it's pretty quite impressive of what what you've combined in yourself so there's a there's a there's a unique harp that you can start playing now with, <laughs> with, with the background that, that um, is exciting. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity and just for your kindness and really enjoyed the conversation. Me too, me too. And I look forward to posting it and seeing what, what it sparks in people. And um, if they want to get in touch with you, is that, is that okay for you?
Oops, no. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd ah, welcome it. Yes. Great. So I, I need to rush out that my, my forest garden is waiting. There's some plants that need to <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank All right. Bye. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Bye. bye.